this is actually um the you know every time i get a chance to chat with you you probably don't remember me but we've 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 interviewed before i've actually been in your office i think where you are right now are you at the planetary uh, uh, yeah this is my this is my planetarium office yeah 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 so i used to run a video uh for a company called complex back in the day and you and I were the first people to interact from Complex, and then you did some stuff with them later on as well. With oh, the, okay, interesting. With the hot ones with the hot wings. And yeah, stuff like yeah, that. yeah, 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 okay. yeah. And um, we we had some pretty, um, you know, we've had some pretty amazing chats over the years. And I um, I gotta say, I've been really loving, you know, your book uh, to infinity and beyond, which is your latest contribution. You know, uh, and um, one thing that I really enjoy about this book is that it's not the kind of book and I don't want to say the wrong thing here that you want to get digitally. There's like incredible value to getting the hard, you know, molecular version of the book because it's got incredible pictures. Um, you can kind of flip around. It's got really big headlines so you can get captured by, okay, this is the theme and the topic that I just want to take a little bite size read into. And I really appreciate, you know, tackling such a, a, kind of slightly controversial intellectual concept like infinity and really trying to break it down like this. So anyway, I've really been enjoying the book to, uh, to infinity and beyond. And so, it's so available. I can summarize your comments by saying, sure. Uh, because it's a, it was a publishing collaboration with national geographic books. Mm -hmm. So I can summarize what you said by saying national geographic doesn't make ugly. <laughs> right. they, they don't do ugly so yeah it's a it's a beautiful book I, some will only be listening to this uh posting mm -hmm. of course but it's 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 a beautiful book to hold to touch to open to browse i i think i'd say that even if i did not co-author it so yeah so. And, and like it's really interesting because your previous book which i also have and and uh god i can't remember the name exactly right now but it was a it was a little book right it was like uh, you know the whole concept was these sort of bite-sized tiny book yeah so there was a uh, i the previous book was smaller than this that was starry messenger cosmic perspectives on mm -hmm. civilization and then before that there were a couple of books before that but maybe the one you're thinking of is astrophysics for people in a hurry Yes, okay. that's the one. That's the that one. was like yes. that damn near fit in your coat pocket, right? Right. And right. Uh, I enjoyed composing that title mm. to juxtapose the word astrophysics and the concept of being in a hurry. I, I just enjoy putting those two mm. titles together. So, you know, so I can I can imagine a book. You know, neuroscience for people in a hurry. You know, <laughs> <a> neurosurgery for, <laughs> for three right, right. steps. <laughs> It's kind of um, you know the franchise for dummies, but in a hurry, right? Like yeah. You so know, actually, that title was taken, of course. But it's, mm. if people who've read the book will tell you, it's not actually for dummies. It is authentic astrophysics. Nothing is dumbed down in it. You're going to learn real astrophysics, but it was highly cherry picked for its mind blowing value. Mm. And my goal there as an educator is blow your mind every every chapter every page and then you say well i want to learn more and then you go to find other books and documentaries or whatever else but that would be a, a gateway book <laughs> if you want to learn more this mm -hmm. latest one um is in the spirit of my podcast star talk mm -hmm. it's our third collaboration with national geographic so it's the third star talk book to be mm -hmm. published by them and it has the star talk dna which mm -hmm. is uh, science, of course, and but it's three strands. It's a three-stranded DNA molecule. So science, uh, pop culture, and humor. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered empirically, we suspected this would be true, but we needed good evidence. In fact, we received a grant from the National Science Foundation to test this in the early days of the podcast. That if you blend science, pop culture, and humor, people come back for more. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to every three months beg for money like NPR does uh, or any of the public, uh, you know, you know, nobody doesn't love Science Friday, right? But every mm -hmm. three months or so, they, uh, they've got to beg for money because that's the construct of the, of the, you, you only tune in if you already know you're interested in science. And that's a different goal than reaching to people who don't know 
that they could like science, or even better yet, people who know they don't like science. Hmm. All right, Th that's who I'm after. All right, because I want right. to I want to see if I can sort of flip that flip that um, attitude. And so the the book is rich in not only the science, but the pop culture references. It's it's a story of how we've come to discover so our place in the universe and how we came to ascend from Earth's surface, not mm -hmm. only to physically get to places like the moon, but mentally get to places like the edge of space and time itself. And the, there are fits and starts mm -hmm. conveyed in there. Not everything, you know, you read most books, well, this person discovered that and they discovered this, and you think it's just happy-go-lucky all the way to what we now know. But in there, we're very candid about failures that have been endured by our species. And that's the that's where you get the title of to infinity, but then beyond. Right. Like, what are you dreaming of doing? Oh, that's gotta be impossible. I wanna, I wanna float in the air. Well, you can't, okay? You that's impossible. No, I want to go to the moon. What are you crazy? Mm -hmm. That's a, so at a time and in a place that feels like an infinity. And then with fits and starts, and yes, people die because the experiments failed in some catastrophic way. You overcome that. And then now you're beyond whatever that infinity was, and then there's a new infinity in reach. And, you know, to that point, obviously, the to infinity and beyond is also that, you know, that allusion to the pop culture reference that most people would be, uh, you know, familiar with from, you know, the Pixar movie, uh, you know, Toy Story, <laughs> you know, so. so right, right, yes. Yeah, so it's clearly a, 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 there's a, there's a, an homage to Buzz Lightyear. And just to put this in context, there's the question, well, can we use that title? Is that allowed? Mm -hmm. And then you, you, you know, you part the curtains. Oh, wait a minute. National Geographic is owned by Disney. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right. the warrior says, we got this. Okay. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a, you go to Disney Plus, there's a Nat Geo portal. In, sure, sure. Yeah. Right next to Marvel and Disney Classic and Star Wars. Yeah. So I um I have to talk about this or I, or I want to ask you about this because in our in our last interview that we did it was so kind of focused on a specific topic it, it was about time and all this kind of stuff but my favorite science content ever created has to be your reimagination of cosmos oh. and and Brandon Braga who's you know come on on the show and I've had many conversations with him speaks so highly of you and speaks so highly of that process of how you folks created those two glorious Brandon Braga pieces. Was, his, was director of the series and he's also you know he's got serious uh, science chops or sci-fi oh, yeah. chops as uh, one of the writers and I think intermittent directors of uh, st uh, Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I forgot which one. Executive is it? producer. Executive yeah, exactly. producer. Yes, thank you. Executive producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or was it um, uh, Next so Gen? He started, he started in Next Gen, Next and then Gen. he did um, DS9, Voyager. You yeah, know. he stayed with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he stayed with it. He was kind of like the, the captain of it <laughs> um, you know, for quite some time. Yeah. Um, but Cosmos Season 1 and Season 2 – um, are just absolutely glorious. Can you give me a little bit of a of some context of how that all sort of came about? Yeah, so I've come to realize that if you go back to 1980 and you see the original Cosmos with Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. and it is so rich in its capacity to reach you emotionally, mm. not only intellectually, but emotionally, and you say, wow, that's a kind of kind of a signature feature of Cosmos on a level where you can't even categorize it as a documentary because mm. it's operating on a different level in the ways it interacts with you. Yes, technically it is a documentary, but but you don't think of it as one. It doesn't mm. the, the the taste in your mouth when it's done is not like well, I just had my medicine and it's a documentary. No, it's like, wow, I was mm. transported. I would come to recognize, I didn't know this at that time, that the secret sauce in there, it was Ann Druyan. Ann Druyan, uh, Carl Sagan's widow, mm -hmm. um, then uh, he would marry her. They, they, I think they met leading up to the that original Cosmos. They would ultimately marry. 
and collaborate on several books. Uh, Anne Julian, though not a scientist herself, she deeply feels, she's completely scientifically literate and mm. deeply feels the science, all right? It's one thing to know the science. It's a separate thing to feel it because mm. when you feel it and you're a writer, then it just drips in the page of what, mm. what the meaning is of science to you and your thoughts and your, your, your attitudes towards other people, towards earth, towards life, to, to the, the, and so she's a fundamental force operating on the messaging that would unfold in Cosmos. So and she's the writer of rec, co-writer of record for both of those, mm. um, in both of the ones that I hosted. She, sure. uh, in the first one, she co-wrote with a colleague of mine, Steve Soder. Steve Soder co-wrote the original Cosmos. Oh, okay. wow. so, so the DNA for that has threaded through. Um, an interesting little fact, mm. uh, we, we knocked on doors to, 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 re, to do Cosmos this, in this re, um, rejuvenation of the brand and of the series. And, uh, we, you know, we went to PBS, we went to Discovery Channel, uh, and a, a response was, well, we need, and Andrewian was going to be writer, right? Okay. But yeah, yeah. they're remembering her from 40 years earlier. And they're saying, well, we need to get some young writers in there. We need to, <laughs> we need to. And she said, no, 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 no. no do you realize people mm -hmm. like tattooed phrases from Cosmos on their body? Do you sure. know anyone who does that after watching a documentary? So they were thinking that that was like, your daddy's documentary, and we want to make this hip and modern. So we kept refusing until, okay, uh, this is a, an undertold story. Uh, I had befriended Seth MacFarlane. Mm -hmm. uh, I met him at a meeting of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a branch of the National Academy of Sciences that lives in Los Angeles that realized that if you want to get science into the public, it's got to infuse into our greatest pop culture engines we have, and that's Hollywood, mm. uh, be it television or film, uh, figuratively Hollywood. So wherever, if it's it's our it's our entertainment industry. So mm. I was at one of the kickoff meetings for it. So we had a bunch of cadre of scientists, I among them, and and some producer types and writers, and Seth MacFarlane was was among them, and. So, of course, I knew Family Guy, and any followers of Family Guy will know there's a lot of infusion of science intermittently within mm. it, and there's a sci-fi thread that goes through it. So there's a there's an underbelly there that has a sensitivity to what science is and how and why it works. But anyhow, he said, oh, uh, Neil Tyson, pleased to meet you. And he says, oh, give me your number. Maybe when I'm in town, I'll give you a call. This is Hollywood. I don't believe sure. any of that. <laughs> but I said, fine. <laughs> I gave him my contact information, and I was sure I'd never hear from him again. A year and a half later, he says, "Oh, Neil, I'm coming through town. Uh, you got can you got lunch? Can you do That's lunch?" Awesome. And I look at my calendar, and I got stuff there, but it's Seth MacFarlane. I said, "I'm sure, wide yeah. open." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we go have lunch, and he asks he asked me like fifty questions about the Big Bang, mm. and then lunch is over. And six months later or so, uh, I have to check the timing on that, but some, some months later, an episode of Family Guy comes out where Stewie, in his time machine, takes mm. Brian back to the Big Bang. Okay? Mm. <laughs> right. All of his content is in there. And at the end, at the end, there's this big card, you know, on the credit card, uh, credits, and it says science consultant Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> which which you were unaware of. It was no, just a no kindness. Idea. Yeah, no yeah. Idea. Okay, so that's just the that's a, a door opening moment there. The, sure. The, what I'm trying to tell you is, on a later occasion, he returns to New York. We meet, and meanwhile, uh, Anne and I and others are shopping around Cosmos, and he said, um, "You know, Neil, I I've come into some money recently. I think he had signed a big contract." Uh, with Fox Studios, mm. and he said, but I want to do something good. Is there some science experiment, some research project that I... Oh, wow, I just got chills on that one. ...put That's money cool. towards? And I thought, yeah, there are some, but I said, hmm, I have a better idea. <laughs> Why don't okay. you fund a pilot 
for Cosmos so we can show the world the oh. value of these writers that we have that know what the fuck they're doing. His oh. eyes must have gone, whoa. Okay. <laughs> and then he said, I have an even better idea. Okay. Why don't I bring this to Fox? And then I thought, okay, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. <laughs> I, this is not going to work. I just, but then I thought, well, wait a minute. But Fox is has way greater distribution right. Than, right. than PBS and Discovery Channel. And it can reach an audience that maybe we should be targeting. And maybe, so I said, hey, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> yeah. you know, I had to, was, I, was Brandon involved pre- No, 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 no. Brandon is not even anywhere. Brandon not is even anywhere. nowhere at this point. Okay? Oh, wow. Nowhere. It's just the principles, uh, you know, Andrew and Steve Soder from the original, me, an add-on, and one other person who we had who was helping with the um, Mitch Cannold, who was a uh, a producer. Uh, and like PBS produced... had no rights over the IP itself. They oh, had... no. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. No one had. It's all owned by uh, Andrewian now in the estate of Carl Sagan. Mm. My point is, my point is, we set up a meeting with Fox and we sent them the original Cosmos, such as they have a sense of it. And I, I, I this is one of these meetings where you'd never forget. We're mm -hmm. in there, and all the shirts, what do you call the, the heads up, the, the, the high-level guys in the, the, the suits. executives? The, yeah, the executives. <laughs> the, suits. the suits are all in there. And they did see – oh, oh the, so they were supposed to see it, and we were going to meet. And they said, well, they haven't read it yet. Can we delay it? And so oh, they're never going to agree. And then but they, so they finally got around to it, and we had a meeting out in L.A. And they said, well, what would this new Cosmos be? And we said, well, it would, you know, we would take all this into the modern times. And, and so we're interested in, we want to uh, at least film a pilot so that mm -hmm. we can show people what it's about. And they said, well, how many episodes were the original? And we said, well, it was 13 episodes. And they said, why don't we do another 13? <laughs> it's just, it's just oh, casual. Yeah. Let's just do 13. Uh, and then we said, okay, so then, 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 you know, there's the next, okay, well, what because this is fox now okay mm -hmm. yes fox makes makes you know family guy and and the simpsons and all that but fox is also fox news and fox so sure, you know, it fox. Was, so we said well what creative control would you expect to have over this mm. and they said well you know <laughs> No bad language, <laughs> you know. Just whatever the the f what the f the f whatever the FCC, you know. That's that kind of it. And so, so here's here's the the amazing fact about this: PB, PBS and Discovery Channel wanted to control the content, mm. and Fox was completely content ceding that to the creative principle. Oh, I'm so grateful they did that though. It, right, right. And so now it so it got so it got the distribution and the the ad dollars and then Fox acquired National Geographic at the time. So mm. that sent that propelled Cosmos around the world because Nat Geographic has has distribution channels in sure. how, how many 100 how many countries and so it was the ideal platform for Cosmos. And then Disney bought Fox, and Fox had owned uh, Nacho, so the whole package went into Disney, and that so that's the that's the story. Of, uh, and, and from a creative perspective, oh, by the, way, the Disney acquisition but, occurred after the second. Um, yeah, 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 way after. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was after. It was after. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So what? What? One thing about Cosmos that I think is so fun to watch and rewatch and rewatch is this kind of dichotomy that you create between your kind of tangible sort of real world examples and then this kind of animated human element of the human being who brought these insights forward. Um, and it's such a beautiful balance of you in the real world kind of live action environment blended in with these incredibly creative animated segments. How did that whole kind of animated segment part of the show come to be? What we wanted to do was exploit, I mean, in a good way, exploit the fact 
that Fox has an entire animation division. Mm. And in that way, it would make sense that Cosmos would appear on Fox if we folded in these animated vignettes, let's call them that. Oh, I see. So okay. you were actually trying to create, to your point, a little bit of that blending of the pop culture with the science for the distribution. Yeah, yeah. And and the 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 animated parts in the first one, they were uh uh, uh they were it was just a pure animation. In the second mm. one, it was stop action. Mm. Okay. And but in, in both cases, we reserved that vocabula vocabulary for the historical vignettes. Mm -hmm. When we so that you knew at a glance if that was the part of the story we were you were watching then that you can learn about a historical character. Hmm. And that added to the visual diversity of what the, the viewer would experience. It also attracted people. So Cosmos, we had persistent comments that, it, by the way, it aired in primetime, like at nine o'clock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is after the bedtime of an eight-year-old, okay? Right, right. So here's what happens. Eight-year-olds never get to bed on time, even though you want them to. So you can have a, your, an evening to yourself as a, as a, as a parent. But so the parent, you sit down and watch at nine o'clock. The kid comes out with their, with their plush toy, wondering <laughs> what's going on. And then they look at the TV and then they sit on the couch and they're watching Cosmos. And now as a parent, are you going to send them back to bed? Say, no, you can't watch Cosmos. No, you're going to, they're, they're going to stay there. Right. And so, so Cosmos, especially at that time, represented television that uh, 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 unlike other programs of the day, more than one generation can sit on a couch and watch it simultaneously. Mm. Th that was true in the 50s and 60s and part of the 70s, not true in the 21st century because all of TV is stovepipe. Oh, I'm going to watch my, my programs and you're going to watch your programs at a different time on a different TV. Mm. So... We were charmed to learn that it was one of the only uh, one of the only series that you could watch where multiple generations sit on the same couch at the same time. And the younger generation might have a better understanding of the content than the older generation, right? Because science has that little edge to it that like there's an aptitude for it. And when you're younger and more open-minded to these kind of stories, you tend to sort of take it in a little bit more. Yeah, I think there are open-minded adults it's the uh, I I've thought long and hard about that very mm -hmm. comment, mm -hmm. and I've concluded that if when you graduated high school, okay, or if you went on to college, if when you graduated college, you celebrated no longer having to go to class, mm -hmm. then at that moment you became an ossified entity in society. Oh, wow. That's a really interesting insight. No, no, think about that. There, yeah. you know, and there's even an anthem, a rock anthem, uh, celebrating that. It's Alice Cooper's "School School's Out, out for Forever." Summer. <laughs> School's out forever, forever. forever right? Yeah. So these are people celebrating that they no longer have to learn. Oh, that's very interesting. And I don't want to blame them for this. What's going on in school where people can't wait until the buzzer rings? Mm. something's wrong. Learning should be one of the most celebrated acts of the human mind in all of society. Yeah. And, and, and what they should be teaching is how to become a lifelong learner because that's where school then is the beginning of your life. And mm. then we can give literal meaning to the word commencement. Right. Yeah. So, so I think there still are plenty of open-minded adults, but the, those that are closed minded, the, Again, we're not after the people who would absorb it anyway. Yeah, uh, yes, please enter the room. Yes. I want to target the people who would otherwise be closed-minded. As an educator, that's my challenge. Mm. And so many more people would watch Cosmos as a documentary than would watch other science documentaries, and that's a win. Um, so, oh, God, I have so many thoughts, but the one that keeps ringing through my head every day are we getting another one? Oh, <laughs> well, first of all, the 19, the 2014 Cosmos yep. was, was that when it was? Yeah, 2014 was, was 34 years after the original one. Okay? Yeah, yeah. 
34 years. So when we did that and people said, oh, is, is next season next year? Do you have any <laughs> right. idea what this takes? You spoiled us with that one. Yeah, you spoiled yeah. us. Okay, so the second one came six years later. Yep. Uh, it, it aired in 2020. Uh, yep. During early COVID, actually. I remember. I remember very well. Yeah, and so uh, that was uh, six years. But it all hinges on Andrean and her her sure, sure. Um, energy and her creativity. I know she had some other projects she wanted to do. I haven't checked on the late the the latest updates on those. I think she wanted to do a biopic of Carl and her relationship mm -hmm. with him. Um, and so she has connections into Hollywood. Uh, you may remember that the novel Contact was made into a feature film with marquee directors and actors, and that was a Carl Sagan novel. She was involved in that as well. So they, she has connectivity there. But I don't I don't need to host a third. The, we, at some point, the torch cannon should be passed, mm. right? This is how science works. It's not the purview of any one person or the purview of any one generation. So uh, if there is a, a, a third cosmos in this reincarnation, I don't need to be the host of it. What? what, what? You you had me going. I was so excited about the future until you just said that. What? what, well, what, what, what? I'm flattered that like you'll have it no other way. <laughs> no, because that that is that is the Carl Sagan's voice gave you comfort in trying to open your mind to these concepts, and I think that that was the 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 most important part of the reimagining was how how you made me feel like. It's okay for me to have questions, but that you also kind of walked me through the experience. I think one of the most beautiful ones, very simple, is, is when you talk about the evolution of a wolf to a dog. And it's this is my a favorite very, episode. Yeah. And, this, and the wolf shall become a shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. And this is such a complex concept, but you're able, you know, you're chilling out with that nice jacket and the fire and the and the dog is there. And it's just like you no, get that was it. a wolf. That was an actual wolf, by the way, <laughs> right, on a right, right. on a nylon leash that you that the camera didn't pick up in the lighting, and uh, yeah, wolves are not dogs. Just to be clear. right, 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 <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but um, okay, so 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 that's great. There, there's two things I want to segue from the Cosmos conversation um, because one thing that Cosmos did for me, um, and you did this as well, is that now on December 25th, I'm a Catholic. I was raised Catholic, so my tradition is to celebrate Christmas. And I still, you know, I love celebrating Christmas with my family. But I also celebrate um, Isaac Newton on on, on Christmas. And this, is, yeah. mm -hmm. and this is thanks to, to you and to the amazing kind of discovery that I had about Isaac Newton via uh, Cosmos. Have you noticed that the kind of sort of uh, what's what's the kind of the popularity of Isaac Newton has grown since you've sort of. No, I, I, don't, I don't track that. I mean, I'm right. a big, obviously I'm a big fan of the guy. Uh, yeah. If I have a bust of him on the table adjacent to my desk here. Uh, and, uh, but let me be more precise. Mm. I'm not so much a fan of him. I'm a fan of the physics and math that he discovered. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Right, and what happens is because when you start becoming... story has some has some interest. Well, interest yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying yeah. is, when you start becoming a fan of a person, then you're on the border of a cult, because right. in cults, you're it's the person that is everything to you, sure. not just their writings or their right. So I just want to make it clear that I can distinguish between mm. Isaac Newton, the man, and Isaac Newton, the physicist. And I do. So, uh, no, how I, I, I feel about yes. Woody Allen. Like, I have that same kind of vibe about Woody Allen, some of the greatest films I've ever seen. And the person, maybe, is not, you know... You don't yeah, no, I just, I just don't mix the two. I, I, sure. You know, I'm happy to talk about him and his life and his... Um, in an odd life, you know, he was mm. Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he was responsible for protecting the currency the the british currency from uh, counterfeiting and one thing i think little known fact and i i pretty sure this is true i read it once but i haven't seen it re-verified but it's a really it's so obscure mm. why would anyone continue to to 
to to to research this. All right, I'm told that he's responsible for the ridges on coins. Isaac Newton is. Yes. Okay. Ask why. Um, why? Why? Okay. So, in the day when coins were made of actual precious metals mm -hmm. like gold and silver. The, the coin would come into your possession and you say, no one will notice. Let me shave off a little bit on the outer edge. Mm. And you collect it in a little bowl. And then you put the coin back into circulation. Oh, then you're so you siphoning a off. A little bit of, yeah. A little bit. If enough coins come through your possession, you then, and so what was happening is the coins were shrinking, literally shrinking in physical size. So he said, if we put ridges on the coins, you will know if the coin's been tampered with. Wow. That and if you look at our sense. currency, there's ridges on the quarter, on the nick on the dime, but not on the nickel and penny. Because mm. no one would shave off copper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. Yes, yeah, so we have it on our higher valued coins. And of course, the silver dollars. Yeah, so... Um... So to go this back, is an interesting tradition. So he, 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 the fascinating things about his life. Yeah. Oh my God. Um. So to, to go back to Carl Sagan a little bit because I know you love comedy and and, and you know uh, Star Talk. If you guys haven't listened to it, it's one of the maybe the best consistent science podcast out there. Um. Is there's there's a gentleman that I've worked with, um, and we won a Webby Award just a few years ago for some comedy sketches that we did. Um doing deep fake technology like but this is like old school deep fake technology when it was first coming out his name is Josh Robert Thompson so it was shallow fake if it was yeah fake. shallow <laughs> fake and Josh Robert Thompson I'll send you a link after we're finished uh, with with the conversation does the best Carl Sagan impression you've ever seen have you ever seen uh, do, do you have any idea what I'm talking about Josh well, Robert I've Thompson? seen some impressions that I thought were very good I'm Carl Sagan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one is on another level. Yeah. Josh Robert Thompson, shout out to you, my friend. I'll send but what, you. Wait, wait. But was he wearing a turtleneck when he did this? Oh, oh, oh. He's he's walking by the beach, wearing a turtleneck, and like, it's such a great moment because he's like having this great uh, sort of philosophical conversation about the beach and the sun and the stars, and then the tide gets too close to his foot. And then he's like, oh, shit, come on, come on. Is anybody going to, you know, so he starts getting angry, like, during the <laughs> filming. Anyway, I got to send you this clip of okay. Josh Robert Thompson doing Carl Sagan. Anyway, uh, total non sequitur there. Um, so to me, I, I love the Nobel uh, Prize in physics because it's like the gift that keeps on giving every year. And just when I think I'm starting to kind of understand what the last one was about, you get the new one, and now you're completely confused again. Um, last year's uh, Nobel Prize in Physics um, was about, um, you know, the 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 quantum entanglement and, you know, taking Einstein's, um, you know, sort of spooky action at a distance paradox and sort of, you know, giving a little bit more insight to that. Wait, wait. This, that was the year before. That was 2022. Oh, that was 2022. So yeah. 20, yeah. Yeah. 2022 yeah, 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 yeah. was quantum entanglement. 2023 is Atto Seconds. The Atto Second, right. Yes. And, and Nobel Prize is straight, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's what I meant to say was, was uh, you know, because I forgot that we're in 2024. So I got my world line incorrect. I apologize <laughs> about that. So, so this Atto Second thing. I think really ties in nicely with your book, actually, uh, to infinity and beyond, because you're discussing this concept of infinity. And my very, very loose understanding, because I just started digging into it, of the Addo second, is that this is kind of the highest definition measurement that we have created in a tangible way that isn't this kind of infinity where you just sort of add one, right, which is just keeps going forever that it's actually tangible. So anyway, I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts about this because I just pretty much heard about it and I, I you know, can't wait to sort of dig into it, but I know yeah, nothing well, about it. Thanks for making that reference. It is a, it, it is in the spirit of To Infinity and Beyond mm. because you can say to yourself, um, well, let me give a different, let me give another example, which is, which is a very tangible, but, and the, the theme of it applies, mm. all right? 
uh, if I ask you, how do we define a day? What would you tell me? Um, we define a day by um, the rotation of the earth. Perfect. Okay. So that makes complete sense. Hmm. So we take the rotation of the earth and then we attach some clock mechanism to it. Okay. That, hmm. that, okay. So the day and the clock goes for that length of the day and it's calibrated against the, the rotation of the earth. So now I ask you, suppose the rotation of the earth changed. Hmm. How would you know it if the rotation of the earth is your metric for measuring the length of a day? Because there would be a discrepancy between the two measurements, right? Well, you need, you would the... need something more accurate than the rotation of the earth. Right. Okay? And I'm old enough to remember that your, clock, your wristwatches and clocks – they would boast it's accurate to a minute a week, okay, <laughs> or five minutes a month. And so so everything else was less accurate than the precise rotation of the Earth until the 1960s, where we said we can do better than the Earth. We can create an atomic clock that has a precision of timekeeping way better than the precision of the rotation of the earth. So you set, you match it up and say these many vibrations of the atom equals a day. Mm. Okay. And now you look to the vibrations of the F, forget the earth. Now you just check the vibrations of the atom and come back every now and then and compare. And what we found was that the rotation of the earth was slowing down. Mm. You cannot measure that unless you have something more precise than the thing that is the thing. Mm. Okay? So, when and since the early 1970s, we've been adding leap seconds into the calendars, but 23 or something, somewhere around there, leap seconds added to the year to compensate for the fact that Earth is, the rotation rate is slowing down. Right. Okay. So... If you want to measure a phenomenon that lasts, no, no, that's that story. Now let's get to, let's work our way to the atosecond. second. Mm -hmm. If you want to measure a phenomenon that lasts a thousandth of a second, you cannot take an exposure that lasts a tenth of a second to capture that. Mm. Because whatever was happening, it's completely blurred out. Mm. You have to photograph it at a unit of time smaller than the duration of the phenomenon you're trying to capture. Mm. We've all seen perhaps photos of like a bullet passing through an apple or all right. That only became possible when the strobe light was invented. Sure. No one knew, had any idea what any of that looked like until you could capture an instant shorter than the time mm. it took the bullet to go through the apple. And once you've done that, oh my gosh, look at what this is. Oh man, you just opened it up for me. I get it now. Okay, so the nanosecond yeah. is a yeah. pulse of light that is a billionth of a billionth of a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if you can have a pulse of light that's a billionth, then you can see things that take place on that time scale and not any longer. And what would that include? Electrons moving around in the atom and among molecules. Hmm. We can observe the formation of molecules and electrons changing their, their orbital configurations. It is, a, it is a vista we previously knew was happening, but we never actually could capture it. Well, you knew Earth is rotating, but did you actually measure it with precision to know how accurate it is? We know electro, that's how we make molecules. We knew this. Did we ever see it? No. And now we can. In one oh, of no the, problem. in one of the, um, oh, by the way, of... just work our way there. So there's yeah. a millisecond, a thousandth of a second. Yep. There's a, sorry, sorry. There's a, um, I'll get my metric prefix, prefixes straight. <laughs> okay. So a thousandth of a second is a, uh, was that a millisecond? A millisecond, yeah. There's a millisecond. Yeah. There's a thousandth. Then a millionth of a second is a, is a 
Na nano? No, no, no. Uh, 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 microsecond. Okay, microsecond. No, no, no. What was the thousandth? What did I say the thousandth was? But milli. The, milli. Uh, uh, then micro. Then nano. Which one's nano? Uh, Nano's a billionth. A billionth, okay. Okay, so you have, you have thousandth, millionth, billionth. We're going three zeros at a time here. Okay. Uh, so a nanosecond is a billionth of a second. That's fun because light travels one foot in a nanosecond. Speed oh, wow. of light, one foot in a nanosecond. All right. Uh, very close, like 11.9 inches or something, last mm. I checked. All right. Um, so, so we have milli, micro, nano. Um, then femto. Is that right? Uh, femto second? I've never even heard of God, that. No, one. that's a fun one, isn't it? Femto. <laughs> uh, the, the femto. Um, oh, pico. Uh, uh, then we have a pico second, which is a trillionth of a second, femtosecond, and then attosecond. And, and each of those is one one thousandth the previous one. There's enough attoseconds in one second as there's been seconds in the entire unknown uh, length of the universe or something Correct. like this? Correct. I mean, and, and we can physically, like, capture this? Like, like we, we have yep. to... Yeah, this it, is this is to infinity and beyond. Okay, just to put the book in context here, the yeah. infinity and beyond book. If we were two hundred years ago, and we're having a conversation similar to this, you're saying, "You mean we can fly in the air one day with something that weighs more than no, no really? You crazy? No, I can't be. No, no, that's you two hundred years ago in this conversation." Okay, yeah. so now you're saying, what? <laughs> a billionth of a billionth of a second? That's mind-blowing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so in 50 years, that'll be like, sure, your ca your camera could do that. You know, you, you said something. Not um, really. I don't think your camera can do it, but that's, that's the it's the trend lines of... Yeah, uh, yeah. My camera can do 90 frames a second if I'm lucky, but there's one thing that, that you've... There's a couple of things that you have said that have stuck with me and guide me in my business. So my core business is that I have a VR development company and I make a VR social platform that is, you know, kind of like a, a simulation of sorts, right? It's like the crudest version of that, right? It's like, like, um, but one day you can imagine something like what I'm working on becoming a simulation type thing, right? Um, and um, God, I just, I'm so, so sorry. I just totally forgot my, oh, it, it's, you you have these two sayings that have stuck with me my entire professional career, which is one that, and I'm going to butcher this, but the sentiment is that Da Vinci sees a bird flying and it says, if that can fly, then I know that the flight is kind of possible, right? So you can figure out a way that if that's happening, even though it's a completely alien or 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 not alien, but foreign um, entity, it's achieving flight, then it's it's reasonable for me to also achieve, you know, flight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, let me tighten up what you said. Please, so please. So there was a time where people, engineers and others who should know better, said heavier than air flight is impossible. Mm. And it's like, what? Birds are heavier than air and they can fly. Mm. So what you really just said is, I'm not smart enough to figure out <laughs> how to fly like a bird. That's but yes. the ego prevents a person from confessing that to themselves. All right? People said, oh, the sound barrier will never go faster than the speed of sound. Well, the tip of a whip goes faster than sound. That's why it makes that cracking sound. It's like a, mm. it's a mini sonic boom, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, bullets, high-speed rifle bullets, travel faster than sound. So... So figure it out, dude, all right, <laughs> rather than saying man will never. Die. So these proclamations of what we will never achieve when in your environment exist things that already achieve it are some have led to some of the most boneheaded comments and predictions ever made. Yes. And I oh, have math, used... they call existence proofs. Yeah. I don't know how to get there, but one of these exists. So therefore, I should I should keep working on it. That I have to remember the existence proof, but this this little philosophy I have taken, and every time one of my engineers, one of my developers tells me you can't do something, I always find that little existence proof. It's just like if they're doing it, 
to some degree, we can also do it. it it's it's this incredible um, shield that you have against the the word no, you know. <laughs> and the second thing that that you said no that blew, is intellectually lazy. Yes, yes, agreed. Um, is you also said um, that nothing in the universe comes in ones. And oh, to, huh? I, to, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Am I butchering that? Am I butchering except this? for maybe the universe itself? <laughs> but but that's that's the point, right? Even that, because now we have the multiverse, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I've had um this this lady from the University of North Carolina on the podcast who um was I think up for the Nobel Prize with a group of people for finding that from the Big Bang you can actually um sort of mathematically see the effects of multiple big bangs in the cosmic background, you know, radiation. People look for it, but they, they I don't think they found it. Right. Or, or somehow she was involved in this and yes. like the math was looking good. And the, because like, basically what she said is that it would predict certain cold spots yeah. or hot spots in the cosmic background radiation, which they indeed found at the locations where the predictions you know were made yeah i don't know if I, I haven't followed up on that but i my understanding is there was some uh tasty elements of the of the microwave background that might have suggested it but mm. on the whole the answer was no and so that's uh, that would be major headlines of course yeah, the of evidence course. of a parallel universe embedded in the cosmic microwave background that that you wouldn't be able to get through a news cycle without that hitting headlines. Yeah. So, so one thing that I, I sort of jumping around a little bit here and I want to be respectful of your time. So I know I only got about 14 minutes left with you. Um, and I really appreciate this, Neil, like every time I get a chance to speak with you, it, it's like a true privilege. So thank you once again. Um, so one thing which I think my sort of gaming audience would relate to and I think it really combines everything you've talked about into this beautiful little nugget is talk to me about action comics, number 14. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, which is, I think so cool because there's an actual constellation in the sky that I won't say the name. I'll let you sort of talk about it a little bit where a certain person might've been born. And I, I I'd love to hear about that because that's, I think is to your mission the realization of everything you work on, right, is to combine science, education, pop culture. So, okay, well, thank you. That'll probably eat most of the remaining time. That's the, the, the <laughs> warning. All right. So, uh, some years ago, when would this have been? Maybe even ten years ago, mm -hmm. I got a phone call from DC Comics. They said, "This is Dr. Tyson." I said, "Yes. H hello. How can I help you?" And they said, "Well, <laughs> we have a storyline that we're going to put in our next um, issue." of action comics that involves Superman um, where he sees the destruction of Krypton. And we want to place that at the planetarium where he's using your special equipment to observe this in the sky. And I said, uh, what am I going to say no to this? This is <laughs> Superman, right? Say, so, yeah, you, you have my permission to represent the planetary the, the hayden planetarium mm -hmm. uh here for to do this but then i got into it and i said well you, tell me more and he says well uh the light from the destroyed planet is just now reaching earth so then i had to i had to ask questions and i said well um how old is superman and they said, oh, he's eternally in his late 20s. So I said, okay. <laughs> so that means his star system is in the late 20s, light years away. Oh, wow. Because okay. that's how long the light would have taken to get here. Just I wanted to make sure they understood this. And they said, yes, okay, we understand that. Then I said, all right, if that's the case, it means Superman, who was launched Moses style from his home planet just before its destruction. And he arrives on Earth basically instantly. You know this, any parent would know this, because infants change rapidly month mm. by month. And the infant that was launched in the basket and the infant that arrived on Earth are no different in age, mm. not in any fundamental way. So there are two ways that can happen. 
either the basket was sent at the speed of light, in which case its occupants do not age, all right? But if it was sent at the speed of light, so would the light from the destruction mm -hmm. of Krypton. And he would have arrived on Earth at the same time that anyone on Earth would have observed this. But this is 27 years later, all right? So what's up with that? So I said, he's had to have come through a wormhole. A wormhole, you can beat the light beam, and you get here basically instantly. I, I told them this. So, okay, yeah, yeah. good to know. Thank you. Okay. So then I said, at a planetarium, we just have a dome where we project things on the sky. But what we can do is create a makeshift telescope of telescopes around the world, have all the data come to our computers, and use all the world's telescopes as one coherent telescope dish we, we do that now for the event horizon telescope that's how we photograph the black hole mm -hmm. you have telescopes far and separated that act as though they are one telescope that's that wide yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you get the resolution you need to show what you need and so he would need the resolution to see the destruction of the planet so i said okay we can do this but then i said but it would require like the world's best supercomputer to compile he says well he's superman he could <laughs> he can he could he could just put his Superman energy in the computer and make it a supercomputer. I said, fine, that works great. Okay. So then they said, do you mind if we portray you? in the <laughs> so, so these are, there's certain questions in life where no is not an option. Okay. You're not going to say no to that. Not because I'm threatened, but because duh, it's super. Yeah. Put me in with Superman. All right. Plus, I'm the director of the planetarium. So they draw. They, they, all right. And then I said, <laughs> then I got a little vein on them. And I said, you know, if it makes no difference to you, could you take off a couple of pounds? On my <laughs> I've Only seen the, it makes no difference to you. I've I seen the doctor, panel. You look great in the panel. I know. I, I know. So you're wearing, they, you're, you're wearing your best. They, right. So they said, oh, Dr. Tyson, this is the world of the comics. Everybody looks good. All right. <laughs> so so that that was great. Um, meanwhile, my technician that they drew uh, had a paunch. And I thought, you know, they could have hooked him up too, but they didn't. Anyhow. So I said, you realize I can find you an actual star that's 27 light years away. I can find you one. Okay. That's red. All right. The, you know, the Krypton star is red. And they said, you could do that? Yeah, we got a, a billion, zillion stars. I can find <laughs> one. That's plenty of those, yeah. I can find a red star that's that distance. That's great. So then I came back to them with like three choices. And they picked one uh, in the constellation Corvus, mm. which is a constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. And I said, because uh, each constellation is a Latin name, and then there's the translation. So it's Corvus the Crow, all right? Mm. And so I said, oh, why that one? He says, oh. Because the mascot at Smallville High was the crow. And I said, bada bing. There Chills. it is. Again. There it is. Oh, okay. There so it is. So there's an actual star that is reported in that in that um, episode, what do you call it? Uh, issue, uh, mm -hmm. Action Comics 14. That and you give the coordinates of the star, the coordinates are in there, and it, you can find it in catalogs, and it's a red uh, star. Um, and there it is. So in the, in it, he's looking and he watches his planet get destroyed. And this star, can you actually, um, naked eye spot it or you need telescope? I think it's just below naked eye. Uh, what we call it. I, I, I have to remember like sixth magnitude, fifth magnitude be hard to see. It's not like one of these bright stars in the night sky. No, yeah, Bin binoculars for sure. You can catch it. So, but anyway, so, you get the coordinates are there. So I was very honored to be in the camp. And for a while, I would go by every comic book store and say, you have any of these? I'm happy to sign them. <laughs> right. You can put them on display. And But then I got tired and I stopped doing it. But but, uh, but it's canon. I mean, that's the bottom line, is that Superman comes Oh, from... I, yes, I added to the canon of Superman's story storyline. Yes, that, that's the privilege and that's the honor. The privilege. Not just showing up with him in the comic, but that there's... So now, now. Just a caveat here. Yeah. That star, its distance had a large uncertainty to it at the time. Mm. It was like 27 plus or minus six light years, something like that. 
we later had better telescopic data to establish the distance to that star, and we've tightened it up. And so it's no longer 27 light years. It's like, I have to, I don't remember. It was like 16 light years or something. Oh, it actually got closer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was within the error bars of the thing, but was the, and so it doesn't work as well as, but, um, as the original, but it's there and, you know, we'll keep it. So look, we only have about five minutes here. So uh, I told I'll... you eat up all the rest of your time. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, it's such a. Oh, by the way, it's... by the way, there's a yeah. scene where Superman sees the explode his exploding planet and he looks sad. When is Superman drawn sad? Not angry. He's sad. Right. Like you, you, he needs a hug. And there's one of, I need a hug, sad. And right. I just thought that was an uncommon moment. It was a sensitive, tender moment for Superman. Yeah. Um, the one, one thing that I've always kind of wondered about, and maybe there's a really simple answer to this, is... Oh, one, oh yeah, one other thing. Sorry, I keep I'm interrupting sorry. you. Uh, yeah. so, so how tall is Superman? So uh, I'm 6'2", six six two, two. right? right? No, it didn't matter how tall he actually is. He can't be shorter than anyone else in the room because right, right, right. doesn't work. Okay, so he so he's like six four in the picture, right, right, relative to my height, and and that looks fine. Everything fine, right? And I think in in the movie, in Superman one, he says he's six four. Yeah, yeah, so. six four is what I've always heard, which is Dan Marino's height. So I've always kind of mm -hmm. put those two things together. But the this idea of Superman seeing his exploding star. And wanting Which to whole watch planet it was destroyed. It's the planet. I'm sorry, the, yeah. the planet mm -hmm. surrounding the star. Um, do we have any like photographic or telescopic evidence of supernovas as they happen? This it, it's like a question that sounds pretty simple, but every time I try to look into this topic, I can never really find good answers on it. it no, because because we don't, you know, a star that. Uh, that explodes as a supernova lives a million years or so, maybe a hundred thousand years. So you can't just train a camera on a star in your life and expect that you're going to catch it exploding when it lives a hundred thousand years. Mm. All right. You know, the, the moment that it, that it explodes is not, we don't have the precision of prediction to be able to do that, but we have an amazing network of observational astronomers all around the world in all time zones. And so much of the sky is monitored all the time. Mm. So when a supernova goes, it gets immediately announced. But in the old days, it was a telegram sent to every observatory around the world. Okay. The Central Bureau of Astronomical Telegrams, there was, a, there was some uh, uh, an acronym that would, and now, of course, then it was email and then it's whatever. Okay. So if one person discovers, no matter where they are in the world, that a star has just exploded, and it goes to every observatory, we all turn our telescopes through because every telescope has a different kind of detector. Some mm. will have take spectra, some are good at infrared, some are good at ultraviolet, and we are very good about this in mm. our collaborations to get data about for these transitory phenomena. So right now there are hundreds of supernova discovered every year. And th then the light lasts for weeks. So you can study it as it got brighter. Um, we finally caught a supernova before it hit its peak brightness, mm. which is something that happens within days. Okay. That, and then it t tails off over weeks thereafter. So, 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 that's sorry, how that so, works. so, so, so last one um, the constellation Orion um, has a red giant in it called Betelgeuse. It's probably one of the most famous stars in the night sky. Betelgeuse, yeah. Yeah, Betelgeuse. I I call it Betelgeuse because of the movie, but yeah, be, you know, Betelgeuse. Well, it's Arabic, so it's Betelgeuse. Yeah, it's it's actually Arabic, as are the names of two thirds of all sure. named stars in the night. Yeah, which is another Arabic incredibly name. interesting topic, but that's for another podcast. Uh, um, that that you had also taught me about these things, right? Which is the value of education and forcing that amongst its people, given that you know the Arabic community was the forefront of astronomy anyway we, we can get into that yeah, a thousand years ago the golden age of islam that yeah was, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um so betelgeuse is 
a candidate for supernova, yes, right? Sir. And so let's say it were to go to supernova, um, how how long would the constellation not look the same anymore? Would it be an instant thing that that one star no, no, is just now that one gone? star. Betelgeuse is his, depending if you draw Orion facing you or facing away, he's been variously drawn both ways. But it's, it's his upper shoulder. Mm -hmm. It's the star that represents uh, his upper right shoulder if he's facing you. And the, uh, the star would get very bright. I, I have to check my calculations. It should be bright enough to be seen in the daytime, but I have to check. It might not be, but uh, it's a very knowable fact. It's just because I don't know it in this moment. Sure. A very calculatable fact. And then when it's done, it will be this much dimmer object, um, typically a pulsar, and you'll, there'll be a gas cloud around it. It'll still be an interesting astrophysical object, all right, afterwards, but it won't be the bright star that it currently is. But the rest of the stars will just be happy. They're, they don't care. But which is from happening. from from our vantage point how would would it take a week for us to no longer see the shoulder of beetlejuice or would it remain just slightly different oh no no once it blows up the, the star is gone the star is done so you're going to see the light of the explosion for several weeks and it'll just get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until you just see the remnant of the supernova which right. is typically a neutron star which if it pulses, we call it a pulsar, with with gaseous stuff around it, leftovers from the from the and, supernova and, explosion. And Betelgeuse is about how far? It's about... I don't remember. It's it, it's very look-upable now. Is it sure, like, sure, sure. 300 light years? I, I don't remember. So, 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 so then the explosion would have happened... Like, it might already have exploded. We just haven't seen it yet. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true <laughs> for anything that... Ha yeah. I mean, in a conversation across a table from someone, they could have exploded, and you wouldn't have known it for another <laughs> four billionth of a second. Okay, this is having even watch yeah, much yeah, closer. Yeah. Four <laughs> atom seconds. But Neil, wow, this has been so cool, man. Let me just get this so real much. quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, forgive me for not just having it off the top of my head. Oh, oh, oh it, no, no, not at all, not at all. Yeah, so Bale Juice went six hundred and fifty light years away, so it's okay. in the hundreds of light years. So if it, if we see it explode tomorrow, then it exploded, you know, back in the fourteenth century. Yeah. And it's most likely, given the current state of the star, that it has exploded, right? Or there's no way to ever no. Because what's six hundred years when it lives for a hundred thousand? Right, no. right, right. We're, right, we're not right, that. Right. We don't know. Right. It could, right. It, could, it, could, it, it could be another ten thousand years before it explodes. No, we're, we're not that good. Well, the the podcast is Star Talk. The book is to infinity and beyond. This is the great Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, thank you so much, sir. You know, once again, it's been just such an honor to get to speak with you. Happy to serve uh, you and your your fan base and your audience. Cool, and keep thank the, you. Keep, keep up your other work with the VR. And, oh yeah. And, and Do the, you have a VR headset? The Geekosphere. Your your player in the Geekosphere. Yes. Do, I do, don't. do you have a VR headset? I do. Uh, I have the the. I I, I don't use it much because I just putting stuff on my head. I always felt that was like, what am I doing? I I like I like. Real reality, relative to virtual yeah. reality. Oh no, for sure, I like real reality too. But yeah. there, 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 there's some really cool thing about experiencing um, social virtual reality that I that I'm in love with. And if you're I in a whole conversation for my podcast in it with the headset um, with uh, Zuckerberg. Okay. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. Well, we were avatars in our own VR setting, sure. and I was pointing out new images from. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, and right. we, we we were we were we were on a spaceship, right? And we had the big uh, 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 window in front of us. Oh, that's uh, cool. On the on the deck, right? And uh, the, 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 so they put James Webb images in front of. So I was like the, his tour guide for that. <laughs> yeah. hey, he's a lucky man. Um, all right, sir. So thank you so much for your time. Um, he's Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know, he needs no references. He's just like he's one of the most Googleable guys. Um, in the U.S. So thank you once again, sir. All right. and thank you all, and we'll see you all soon. You got it.